A reading from the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. As I read these words, would you listen for a good word from the Lord? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption in God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fred Rogers once said, Everyone longs to be loved, and the greatest thing we can do is let people know that they are loved and capable of loving spoken like the ordained minister and great teacher of children that he was. He strikes at the heart of so much of the human condition. Everyone longs to be loved. And if the loving component is missing, there is so much that can be thrown off. We need to know that we are loved, that in someone's eyes we have value and worth, that someone cares that we exist and that we have a chance to thrive. When we know that we are loved, we know that we matter. Now, in her book, The Preaching Life, the great preacher and Christian writer Barbara Brown Taylor tells of what it was like to know that she was truly loved by her grandmother. She describes her grandmother as a tough, stern woman who was an awesome presence, she said, especially to a child. She says she was known most for her shrewd business sense and for her bad temper. Even her appearance was intimidating to some, with both legs amputated and um, untreated diabetes, And with dark aviator sunglasses to protect her eyes, Taylor said she looks like a handicapped bomber pilot. But this grandmother lavished her love on her grandchildren. When they came to visit, there were special treats and piles of presents and long, lazy afternoons together. Each child received a night of pampering during the visit. And Taylor says she remembers hers by saying that it was a night that came. She was treated like long life royalty. She was filling the tub with suds and then beckoning her in where she washed each of her limbs in turn and polished her skin with a great soft sponge. And after she had dried her off, she anointed her with Jurgen's lotion. Then she reached for her dusting powder. Evening in Paris, it was called, and tickled her all over with a pale blue puff, she says. When she had done, she knew she was precious. She was absolutely convinced that she was loved. At the very heart of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the reminder that you are seen, known, and loved by God. No matter who you are, where you come from, or what you have done, you are God's beloved. You are God's child. That is your identity. That is your story. There are other voices, including your own, within you that may try to rewrite this story or drown out the voice of God. But ultimately, we are all like Christ emerging from the baptismal waters in that God who made us wants us to hear as clearly as Jesus did that we are God's beloved. That is the message that the writer of the letter of Ephesians wants us all to hear as well. The scholars debate whether the letter was written by Paul or by an assistant to whom Paul might have been dictating or maybe even someone writing in Paul's own name after he had passed on, which happened in that time in order to carry on the tradition of a great thinker or leader. It bears the name of the churches of Ephesus. It was likely a circular letter. That is to say, it was a letter that was not written to a single church, but that was to be passed on from church to church through a network of churches. 
so that the message could reach a broader audience. Now, unlike some of Paul's other letters that were written to specific churches with specific issues of conflict and concern that need to be addressed, a great deal of what is written in Ephesians is at the very heart of what everyone needs to hear. You are loved by God. No matter how anyone else treats you, you are loved by God. No matter how many times you have failed, you are loved by God. No matter what anyone else says about you, you are loved by God. No matter what you think or feel about yourself, you are loved by God. Well, how does God love us? Let me count the ways. In Christ, you received blessing from God. In Christ, you received adoption as a child of God. In Christ, you received redemption and forgiveness to counteract the things that you may have done to sin against God and others. In Christ, you are given a glimpse into the mystery of God's desires for the entire world. In Christ, and because you are adopted as a child of God just as Christ is, you are given an inheritance. In Christ, you are given a destiny both in this life and in the one to come. In Christ, you are given the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide, guard, and direct you throughout your years. In Christ, and because of everything else in the list, you are given a hope, a hope that cannot be taken away. This is what it means to be a child of God. This is your identity. This is your story. Scholars have pointed out that in ancient times, particularly in ancient Greco-Roman literature, there was a particular genre that entailed adoption fantasies. These fantasies told prince and pauper type fables that imagined what it might be like for someone who came from nothing to suddenly be adopted by a person of wealth and means and influence. It could be a Roman senator who was coming to the end of his life and realized that he had no heir to whom he could pass on his possessions once his life had come to an end. Well, today we might imagine that it would be like someone who struggled but then they were adopted by someone incredibly wealthy and famous, say a Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Elon Musk or even a famous movie star like George Clooney or Angelina Jolie. It's like Annie being adopted by Daddy Warbucks when suddenly you find your circumstances changed with the knowledge that you have been adopted. Not only does it make life more full and thriving in the moment when your benefactor is still alive, but it makes life possible after they are gone because you're given the inheritance. Now imagine Paul playing on those fantasies to explain what it is like to be loved by God. God who is greater than any human being, who is far more powerful than we could ever imagine, who lives eternally and is creator and Lord, that is the one who's adopted you. Because God sees you, sees value in you, God loves you, and God has welcomed you into God's family as brothers and sisters with Christ and the community of the saints. And God is blessing you. This is good news indeed. This is one of those comments that people post on social media where you say, I don't know who needs to hear this, but you are loved by God. You are not alone. You are seen and valued. When placing our hope in Christ, we are adopted and blessed by God to be a blessing to the rest of the world. That's your true story. That's the voice of blessing speaking into your soul when the voice of curses tries to drown it out. And it isn't just your story. It isn't just my story. It's our story. It's the story we want to tell to the world, that we want to teach it to our children from the earliest possible age. On Father's Day of this year, we had the opportunity to dedicate our son, William. Some Christian traditions of the church baptized children, and we, as Baptists, dedicate them. As parents, we present our children in front of the congregation and before God, and we give thanks to God for the gift of this child. Hannah did the same thing for Samuel in the Old Testament. Joseph and Mary did the same thing with Jesus. It is a beautiful moment when parents stand before God and the congregation, and they promise to be a blessing to this child who has been blessed for them, to give him or her every possible benefit of the home, the school, and the church, to raise him or her up in what we call often the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the parents aren't the only ones who get involved in making promises. In essence, the entire congregation is promising in that moment to watch over, to love and support both the child and the family, to be the church that she or he needs. 
We're even asking our children to make promises as to how they will love and support the newest member of their group specifically, too. It's a beautiful moment. And it culminates in the pastor carrying the child around the congregation and introducing him or her to the church. We introduce them to the ones who will teach them the stories of the Bible and help them learn the way that we have seen God at work in human history and how the Holy Scriptures can speak to us. We introduce them to musicians and choir members who will help them learn the songs of the faith that will ring not only in their ears, but even more importantly in their hearts to remind them of God's love. We introduce them to deacons who offer care and mission volunteers who serve out in the world. We introduce them to the ones who should be there for them and who will bless them. In essence, we are attempting to say to the children among us that when all else fails, from your birth to the moment of your death, we will be the ones reminding you of God's love and blessing for you. We will be the ones calling you back to the truth of the story that because our hope is in Christ, we are all part of God's family and we are family to each other. These types of blessings are crucial moments. They remind us of God's undying love. The great Dutch Catholic priest, professor, theologian, and pastoral writer Henry Nouwen wrote that to give a blessing is to affirm, to say yes to a person's belovedness. And more than that, he says, to give a blessing creates the reality of which it speaks. In his book, Life of the Beloved, Spiritual Living in a Secular World, Nouwen tells of one of the most blessed experiences of his time working at La Arc Daybreak Community in Ontario, Canada a community for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As he was preparing to start a prayer service at one of the community's houses, Janet, a member of the community, came up to him and said, Henry, can you give me a blessing? He responded in a somewhat automatic way by tracing with his thumb the sign of the cross on her forehead. Instead of being grateful, however, Janet protested vehemently, he says, No, that doesn't work. I want a real blessing. A bit shocked, Nowen promised to give her a real blessing when everyone else had gathered for the prayer service. So at the conclusion of the service, with about 30 people gathered, Nowen addressed the group and said, Janet has asked me for a special blessing. She feels that she needs that now. He wasn't sure exactly what she felt like she needed, but she stood up and started to show him by walking toward him. He was wearing a long robe with white ample sleeves, covering his hands and as well as his arms. He says that spontaneously Janet put her arms around him and put her head against his chest, and without thinking, he covered her with his sleeves so that she was so enveloped with love that she almost vanished in the folds of his robe. He said to her, Janet, I want you to know that you are God's beloved daughter. You are precious in God's eyes. Your beautiful smile, your kindness to the people in your house, and all the good things you do show us what a beautiful human being you are. I know you feel a little low these days, and that there is some sadness in your heart. But I want you to remember who you are. A very special person, deeply loved by God and all the people who are with you. Janet smiled up at now and letting him know that she had truly been blessed and as soon as she started to walk back to her seat, Jane, another member of the community, stood up and walked in now and, and said she needed a blessing too. And then another after Jane, and another, and another. Until finally, one of the assistants, a 24-year-old student worker at the community, raised his hand and asked, what about him? And with tears in his eyes, he received a blessing as well. You are God's beloved son. Your presence is a joy for us all. Always remember that you are loved with an everlasting love. Blessing moments like this, they reclaim us. They reclaim our identity as children of God. They remind us of who we truly are. And the world needs these blessings as well. The world needs to be reminded of God's story that is being written among us even as we speak. That God loves the world and has given the world hope through Christ. That God desires for all people to recognize their adoption as children of God. And those of us who are Christ followers, who are the church, who recognize that we are adopted as God's children, and the ones who live as signs of God's love for the world, 
We are the ones who look at those struggling with self-worth and say, you are loved and adopted. Put your hope in Christ. We work on the margins where others have been pushed aside, left out and overlooked, and we say, you are loved and adopted. Put your hope in Christ. We stand at the bedsides of those about to transition from this life to the next, wondering if it is something to fear or if it is all just meaningless, and we say, don't worry. You are loved and adopted. Put your hope in Christ. We are the ones who remind a world that is trapped in competition and production and division and zero-sum games, and we say, stop. You are loved and adopted. Put your hope in Christ. That is how we in the church move from simply receiving a blessing to be a blessing for the world. As the church, we cling to that hope in Christ. We recognize the challenges of the world, but we are never overcome by despair. We know God's story in Christ. We know God's plan for the redemption of the entire cosmos. We don't give up on hope for ourselves or anyone else because we know that God's work through Christ offers hope to everyone. I don't know who needs to hear this. Maybe we all need to hear it. You are loved. You are chosen. You are adopted into God's family. You are given an inheritance. You are given redemption and forgiveness. That is your story. That is our story. And because it is our story, we are invited to help others see it as their story as well. So let's show the world where we set our hope, that it might be a blessing and hope for others too. Amen.